Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. In the previous episode, I was turning two steel shafts to this clamp design to be fitted to the watchmaker's faceplate. Late in the episode, I made a mistake badly damaging both parts, and I had to scrap them. The procedure I used to try and make the two shafts was intended to solve two significant problems. Firstly, I needed a way to cut the curved faces to allow the central shaft to fit snugly into the curved slot of the faceplate. In order to do this, I needed to be able to hold the part in the vise in such a way as the part could be rotated around a centre with the correct diameter while it was being cut. The largest diameter of the part was at the opposite end and prevented the vise from being able to hold the part close to the end being machined, so I had to include extra stock length at the full diameter to grip in the vise. I encountered quite a lot of flexing with this approach and the resulting faces were not very parallel. Secondly, I needed to ensure the shaft at the back of the jaws is coaxial either side of the thumb wheel. This shaft controls the orientation of the top jaw, so any inaccuracy will cause the jaw to be misaligned. I was remaking the scrap parts from scratch, so I decided to completely rethink my approach. The first change I made was to abandon attempting to minimise wastage by making both from a single piece of stock. Silver steel this diameter just isn't expensive enough to worry about 10 or 20 millimetres of scrap. The second change was in the amount of material to remove on the lathe before machining the curved faces. I turned a much shorter length down than before, cutting only to the length of the faces. Reducing the diameter makes the milling much easier as it significantly reduces the amount of material to be removed, but the new approach ensured the rest of the part was much more rigid during the milling operations. It also allowed the part to be mounted with less length protruding out of the vice jaws. Once the milling was complete, I brought the rest of the length to rough size, then did a finishing pass along the entire length to final dimension. I drilled the centre hole as before, then immediately tapped the thread. The thread was limited to the length of the tap, as I hadn't been able to source an M3 extension tap yet. This shaft was essentially complete, so I parted it off from the excess stock and tied it up the end. For the second shaft with a thumb screw, I didn't record cutting the threaded portion or the knurl as the procedure was the same as last time. Here are some snippets from episode 10 of that part being made. A critical problem I mentioned earlier was that this thread must be coaxial with the smooth portion of the shaft on the other side of the wheel. I attempted to ensure this by turning all of the features without rechucking, but the part was too flexible to handle the plunge cuts and was bent beyond reasonable repair. This time I tried to solve the problem with a fixture. I drilled and tapped this scrap material so I could screw the threaded shaft into it and turn the other side perfectly coaxial to the thread. The thread was a snug fit so held the part firmly and I was able to tighten against the fixture face to minimise wobble. Using the fixture to turn the shaft down to diameter and length was straightforward. The final two parts to make were the central screw thread and thumb wheel and the steel spacer to ensure the thumb wheel is accessible. I used off the shelf steel threaded rod for the screw and as the thumb wheel is quite simple I decided to make three at the same time. Ideally the stock shouldn't be extended this far out but I was too lazy to set up the bandsaw for just one cut.
Knurling this far from the chuck isn't a great idea, but with this tool there's less side pressure than the straight style knurling tool. Parting this far out isn't a great idea either, but I seem to get away with it. I cut the threaded rod to length, degreased both parts and then fixed the thumb wheel in place using Loctite 638. The spacer has one large end which rests firmly against the back of the faceplate. The other end is tapered to a smaller surface area where it makes contact with the thumb wheel. I think this is intended to reduce friction, ensuring the thumb wheel can rotate while the spacer keeps the assembly rigid and true. That's the last part, so with the parts complete it's time to try out the assembly. As a prototype I'm pretty happy with it. There's a lot too much flex around the top of the top jaw, which I think is due to the tolerances around the central shaft and jaws not being tight enough.
Despite all my efforts, the rear shaft isn't very coaxial either, and in certain locations it can push the jaw out of position and can even jam slightly. The thumbscrew and spacer work fine, so I'll keep those parts unchanged. I've intentionally kept the jaws in their raw rectangular shape until now. Once I have the mechanics right, I'll work out how to machine them into a more practical shape. I can use these prototype parts to experiment with the technique. At this point, the design is essentially complete. There is a lot of refinement to do before the tool is ready for use, but much of that will be repeating work I've already done. I'll pick out the most interesting parts to make the next episode, then I'll post some footage as I learn how to use the tool to make watch parts. Thank you.